I think we'll sing tonight, Jaya Radha Madhava. How many of you know this song, Jaya Radha Madhava? Okay, we have a quorum. So, <coughs> for those who don't know the words, this is a song that Srila Prabhupada was written by Bhaktivinoda Thakur, uh, Srila Prabhupada's, uh, the father of Srila Prabhupada's spiritual master, Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And uh, it's a description of Krishna and Vrindavan. It's a devo and Srila Prabhupada would chant it before, uh, sing it before every class. So it begins, Jaya Radha Madhava, all glories to Radha and Madhava. Madhava is a name for Krishna. Kunja Bihari. Kunja Bihari is he who enjoys in the forest groves of Vrindavan. Kunja is the gardens of Vrindavan. Uh, Jaya Radha Madhava, Kunja Bihari. Gopi Jana Vallabha Giri Vadadhari. So Vallabha means beloved. The gopis are, uh, regard Krishna as the most beloved. They're loving him. The depth of their love is inconceivable. Gopi Jana Vallabha Giri Vadadhari. Sounds familiar? This is New Govardhan celebrating Krishna's lifting of the hill. Giri means hill. Dari means lifting. So he's Radha Giri Hari, and there in each of the corners you see a beautiful little uh, uh, sculpture of Krishna lifting that hill. So Giri Vadadhari, he lifted the best of hills. Uh, Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana. So he's uh, the beloved son of Yashoda Mata. Braja Jana Ranjana, he delights all the residents of Vrindavan. Yamuna Tira Vanachari, and he enjoys pastimes in the groves of trees on the bank of the Yamuna River. So you see, this evokes all different rasas and relations with Krishna in that one little song. So I'll try to think if you can remember the meaning as we chant and see in your mind's eye. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari. Gopi Jana Vallabha Giri Vardhari. Jai and Gopi Janna Vala Bhang Giri Vardhari. Giri Vardhari. Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana. Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana. Yamuna Tira Vanachari Yamuna Tira Vanachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Mr. Pad Bodhamahan Sabadika Charja, Ashto Tertha Shishiman, Divine Grace, Srila AC Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupad Ki Jai. Is Khan Bibiti founder at Charja Srila Prabhupad Ki Jai. Jaya Mr. Pad Bodhamahan Sabadika Charja, Ashto Tertha Shishiman, Divine Grace, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Ki Jai. Ananda Kodi Vaishnavinda Ki Jai. Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai. Sama Veda Bhaktivinda Ki Jai. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glory to Sri Guru and Goranga. Ah, Hare Krishna. So, it's been a while. I was gone for over a month, and then I am in the middle of a marathon. Some of you may know about the uh, Vyasa Puja book, 
Srila Prabhupada's Vyasa Puja book we put out every year. So I've been doing it since time immemorial, since before I, since before I came to San Diego. And so uh, this is just the time when we're getting all the production done, and so I'm very much uh, overwhelmed with that. But I think I can uh, surface a little bit to read Bhagavad Gita. So every so often I like to come back to this portion of Bhagavad Gita, uh, first of all, uh, sorry, I'm out of practice, on this uh, fifth day of May 2019 in San Diego at the Krishna Fest, Sunday Krishna Fest, who's speaking on the Bhagavad Gita, uh, his, by his divine, uh, his translation and commentary by his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. And we're going to be reading a little bit from the eighth chapter entitled Attaining the Supreme, five, six, and seven, with these short purports, because they're a whole lesson, a nice little compact lesson right here in, in this chapter, and then we can explore some of the ideas there. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So those who know this verse can chant a response. Antakale tamameva. Smodan mukva kalevaram. Yakpiyati samad bhavam. Yati naspyata sangshayaha. So Lord Krishna says to Arjun, whoever at the end of his life quits his body remembering me alone, at once attains my nature, of this there is no doubt. Purport. In this verse, the importance of Krishna consciousness is stressed. Can we get a little more on here? My voice is going after that kirtan. Anyone who quits his body in Krishna consciousness is at once transferred to the transcendental nature of the Supreme Lord. The Supreme Lord is the purest of the pure. Therefore, anyone who is constantly Krishna conscious is also the purest of the pure. The word smaran, remembering, is important. Remembrance of Krishna is not possible for the impure soul who has not practiced Krishna consciousness in devotional service. Therefore, one should practice Krishna consciousness from the very beginning of life, if possible. If one wants to achieve success at the end of his life, the process of remembering Krishna is essential. Therefore, one should constantly, incessantly chant the Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Rochitanya has advised that one be as tolerant as a tree. Todor Iva Sahishnana. There may be so many impediments for a person who is chanting Hare Krishna. Nonetheless, tolerating all these impediments, one should continue to chant. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So that at the end of one's life, one can have the full benefit of Krishna consciousness. So this is a very uh, hopeful verse. It's practical. We can chant Hare Krishna. Many of you are already chanting seriously. Now Krishna, in the next verse, he gives the general principle, which is the basis of this verse 5. Those who know, young young bapi, va, young young bapi smaran bhavam, chajat jante kalevaram, tam tamay vaiti kunteya, sadatad bhava bhavitaha. Whatever state of being, whatever state of being, one remembers when he quits his body, O son of Kunti, that state one will attain without fail. Report. The process of changing one's nature at the critical moment of death is here explained. A person who at the end of his life quits his body thinking of Krishna attains the transcendental nature of the Supreme Lord. But it is not true that a person who thinks of something other than Krishna attains the same transcendental state. This is a point we should note very carefully. How can one die in the proper state of mind? Maharaj Bharat, although a great personality, thought of a deer at the end of his life. And so in his next life, he was transferred into the body of a deer. Although as a deer, he remembered his past activities, he had to accept that animal body. Of course, one's thoughts during the course of one's life accumulate to influence one's thoughts at the moment of death. 
So this life creates one's next life. If in one's present life one lives in the mode of goodness and always thinks of Krishna, it is possible for one to remember Krishna at the end of one's life. That will help one be transferred to the transcendental nature of Krishna. If one is transcendentally absorbed in Krishna's service, then his next body will be transcendental or spiritual, not material. Therefore, the chanting of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, is the best process for successfully changing one's state of being at the end of one's life. Now, this third verse kind of sums it all up and gives us uh, the very practical instruction. This one is not so famous. Let's see if anyone knows it. Tasmat sarveshu kaleshu mamanusmana yudhyacha mayarpatamano buddhir mame vaishyasya sangshayaha Therefore, Arjun, you should always think of me in the form of Krishna and at the same time carry out your prescribed duty of fighting. With your activities dedicated to me and your mind and intelligence fixed on me, you will attain me without doubt. Okay, one more short purport. This instruction to Arjun is very important for all persons engaged in material activities. The Lord does not say that one should give up his prescribed duties or engagements. One can continue them and at the same time think of Krishna by chanting Hare Krishna. This will free one from material contamination and engage the mind and intelligence in Krishna. By chanting Krishna's names, one will be transferred to the supreme planet Krishna Loka without a doubt. Om Jnana Timarandasya Jnana Shalakaya Chakshu Unmilatam Mena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. I was born in the darkness of ignorance. My spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada, opened my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge. I offer my humble obeisance unto him and all members of Sri Parampara. So, in these three verses, Krishna gives the summary of the central point of practicing bhakti yoga or any type of yoga. The first uh, assumption, of course, is that we don't just live this one life, that there is a life after death and life before birth. This is the very first philosophical point Krishna makes in chapter 2. Uh, Arjun is, uh, has been covered. He is an eternal uh, associate of Krishna, but he's been covered by Krishna's will to uh, make his calculations, what he's going to do on the, what we call the bodily concept of life. He's, he's uh, in the, right before the battle. It's very dramatic. There's millions of soldiers on each side. Imagine all the elephants and the horses all chomping at the bit. You know, it's a, it's a, about to, the battle is about to happen, which is in building, building, building throughout the whole Mahabharata. And Arjun wants to see who's on the other side, who wants to fight. And there he sees his beloved grandfather, who practically raised him, Bhishma Dev, his beloved teacher, Dronacharya, who trained him in the martial arts, and so many other relatives, friends and relatives and brothers and so forth. And uh, he suddenly says, what do I need this fighting for? What, who, if I win the battle and I have this kingdom, it'll be soaked in the blood of those whom I love. So it'll be worse than, you know, worse than w winning. Maybe I should lose. Yeah, he expressed that twice. We're not sure. Maybe it's better to lose and be conquered by them. They're worshipable and so forth. So this is not the proper attitude of a chapter who's going to lead the, his side to battle. You can see that. So that's the whole first chapter. Is Ar Arjun expressing his great doubts, and it's all based on bodily consideration, all these different relationships. But after all, that's where we live. In our, in our ordinary life, we have our husbands, we have our wives and our children and our relatives and friends, and, and we live within that milieu. And that we very much uh, can understand that kind of identification. It kind of comes with the territory of being in the material world. So, that's, so the whole idea is that, yes, we can relate to Arjuna's idea. We can, we can understand his point of view. And, and Krishna's whole purpose in speaking the Bhagavad Gita, he, he said, I'm not going to fight. You know, but uh, Arjun said, "I don't care. 
you come on my side. I'll have you, and you can have, and, and Duryodhana can have all the armies. This was the choice. You get either Krishna or his armies. So Duryodhana said, oh, great, I'll get all the armies, and Krishna can stay on the other side alone. And Arjun said, oh, great, I'll get Krishna and forget the armies. So they were both satisfied. But Arjun had the best deal. So, so Krishna not, said he's not going to fight. Ultimately, we know he broke that promise in relation to, to Bhishma. That's another thing. But, but so what's, it, what's he going to do? Okay, so he took a menial role as a servant of his devotee in the a chariot driver. Chariot driver takes orders from the, 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 the fighter. So Arjun said, please take my chariot between the two armies. He says, okay, he did it. So after uh, speaking all this, but you know, Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. He had a, uh, kind of engineered this whole battle. He had knew it was coming. Uh, because he wanted Yudhisthira, who was Dharma personified, to take the throne, his beloved devotee. And Duryodhana and company, they had deviated from uh, Dharma, and so they had to be vanquished. He explains that in the Bhagavad Gita. So here's the crisis now. In other words, Arjun is saying, no, I don't want to fight. So at the final moment, the, that's, the ten, that's the drama of the Bhagavad Gita. So at least externally, that's the, the, the context. And Krishna begins, uh, uh, first of all, Arjun, he changes the relationship. He says, rather than my charioteer, or of course my friend, now I accept you as a guru. Karpa nidosho bhata sabhava. He says, I'm bewildered, I'm paralyzed by the, this miserly weakness. I don't know what dharma is, dharma samuda cheta. Please, now I'm accepting you as my guru, my spiritual master. It's a different relationship. The shishya means one who agrees to be controlled, that's the meaning of shishya, by the, the superior. And who could be a, the best, a better guru than Krishna? So now please tell me what's, what's the true way to dharma? How can I achieve shreya, my ultimate good? I'm, I'm, I'm completely lost my way here. So, so Krishna begins his instruction by chastising his disciple, which is really the duty of the spiritual master, to, to you know, give him a nice... Hot, uh, cold, cold shower to begin with, and then so he'll, uh, you know, get going. So he says, uh, you're speaking learned words, but you're lamenting for what is not lamentable, namely the material body. And the first 20 verses, this uh, lesson within the, first, uh, within the second chapter, is all about the soul, the, uh, that the soul is eternal as in contrast to the body, that, uh, that the soul has lived before and will live again. And that, our, that if you simply are on the, uh, calculating on the basis of your bodily relations, that's, uh, ign that's ignorance. That's a sure, a surefire way to, uh, to uh, not get your ultimate good, because, because the body is very perishable. It's very temporary. So that's the, the second chapter. And the rest of the book, of course, is based on that knowledge. For the soul is never birth nor death at any time. He doesn't come into being. He's unborn, eternal, ever existing and primeval. He is not slain when the body is slain. That's us. He's speaking about each one of us. We, don't, we were never born, and we will never die. Sure, the body is born and the body dies, but the body's not us. So our calculations about what to strive for, what is good, and how we should relate in this world to others and to, to, to everything should be on the basis of being spirit, not matter. It's not easy because we're all conditioned. We're for many, many births to be on the bodily concept of life. And so that's what we're used to. But that, that leads to the degradation of the soul if we simply are on the bodily concept or even the mental platform. So... In this eighth chapter, now we've already been through so many previous chapters, but here Krishna, his instructions that we read are based on that understanding uh, that the, the soul takes another uh, birth, that the soul is eternal. And so the, the principle, well, then the, the, next, the, the, the overriding question for every one of us is, well, what can we do now before, in the time allotted to us before we leave this body so that we'll get the best body in the next life. What can we do for our shreya, for our, for our ultimate good? So we, it, it, most people don't ask this question, and that's an utter, utter disaster, because it means that you're simply open to all of these influences of the material energy, and because we live in the Kali Yuga, that means very intense passion and ignorance. <laughs> we, you know, a, a specific beach, right? Well, as soon as I moved here, I says, where are the children? There's no children around. It's a party town. It's all party, you know. 
And, and <laughs> over the years, 30 years, you can imagine, uh, I would always come to Mangal Artik, you know, and especially on the weekend, Sunday morning and Saturday morning, because you got Friday night, Saturday night. The parties would be going strong. You know, I'd get up at 3 in the morning or something, and they're still going, you know. By the time I'm ready to come to Mangal Artik at 4.15, they're starting to, you know, get down. By the time I'm actually on my way over, they're crashing. And, you know, Sunday morning, complete silence. We li I leave here at 8.30, 9 o'clock. It's deserted outside. Everyone is still... <laughs> this is mode of ignorance, you know. So I'm coming over here, and this is this wild party going on. The mu the, uh, across the way from my, I haven't never heard it like this, and just boom, boom, boom. It, you know, it's not real music. It's just it's some kind to 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 awaken the the, the lowest of your energies, you know. <laughs> and it's just on, and I, it's just like some kind of drug, you know. And I know I'm coming over here, and I said, nice sweet kirtan, you see. And you can see the power of sound. Sound really carries the the, the, the modes. If you're in a, in a, in a kirtan, beautiful, nice kirtan, you're lifted up out of the modes of nature. You know, there's Krishna, it's sweet. You know, and, it, and, and the words, pretty much the same, Hare Krishna, Hare Ram, you know. But still, there's, a, there's an ever freshness there because it's, it's transcendental. Whereas this, all the other sounds are, 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 are an essential part of our conditioning. And so Krishna consciousness means, first and foremost, to start vibrating and hearing the transcendental sounds. Well, how do, what, what do we know what they are? We have to get knowledge from the transcendental source, such as Bhagavad Gita as it is. The, the, the Hare Krishna mantra, of course, but all these, these verses are mantras also. Antakali chamam eva smodan mukta kalevaram. Antakali, at the end time, at the time of death. One who remembers me will certainly come to me. If you have faith in that, then, and you learn about what it means to go to Krishna, what's going on in that spiritual world. I was just reading the Brahma Samhita, you know, beautiful verses at the end there. Shriya kanta kanta parama parusha kalpataravo dhuma bhumis chinta managana mahita. Describes that in that spiritual world, there's Krishna with all of his the wonderful goddesses of fortune, with the gopis, you know. And all of the, uh, the land is made of chintamani gems. The water is not just water, it's pure nectar, you know. And the one can always hear Krishna's flute. There's no just walking. You don't walk there. You say, well, everything is a dance. And every, all the, the, the speaking is all singing. And there's, uh, everything is glowing with chidananda. It's like spiritual, blissful energy, which you can taste. You know, the, the senses, just like we read about in the beginning of that Brahma Samhita uh, prayers, how Krishna can perform the activities of all the senses with all his uh, senses. So when you offer on the altar, if the devotion is there, you know, prepared carefully, he sees that, he tastes that, that's how he tastes it and becomes prasadam. You know, so we also have bodies like that. We have a spiritual body, which is not li certainly not getting old or diseased. You know. There's not a moment passes away there's no past, no future, the eternal present. This is our home. When Prabhupada said, go back home, back to God, and that's what he's talking about. So we're all kind of exiles here, isn't it? For millions of births, we, we had no idea of who we really were. We're identifying with all these, and let's, let's just be honest, let's just think for a second, that we've been through all these lower bodies. Can you just imagine what that was like? Consciousness so rudimentary and you know, nosing around and as a dog or something. You don't even want to think about it. But that's where we were. We finally come to this human form of life, and now the fortunate few out of the millions of people in this, in this area <laughs> are actually thinking about transcendence, about Krishna, about spirit and spiritual matters. So there's, there's a great urgency to it. And we, we, you know, when every, t every time I work with uh, this Vyasa Puja book, I read so many. Uh, offerings to Srila Prabhupada, and many devotees recall Srila Prabhupada's uh, incredible effort that he went through to give us Krishna consciousness. I'm um, just rereading the Prabhupada Lilamrita. If you get a chance to read that, it's a wonderful biography by Satsup Maharaj, very exhaustively researched. And uh, Srila Prabhupada is struggling in India. You know, his, 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 his business has failed. He was a householder, he had five children. And uh, he was working very hard to support him. But at the same time, he's becoming more and more attracted to uh, preach Krishna consciousness. He's meeting with the other members of the Gaudiya Math, Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati's uh, institution, which is very, very flourishing when Bhaktisiddhanta was there. 
And uh, uh, he has this instruction, which he's taking as his life and soul. You should preach in English uh, the, the, the eternal philosophy of Krishna consciousness, as uh, you've learned it. And uh, possible, go abroad. He, you know, he gave him that instruction to begin to pre preach worldwide. You know, so Prabhupada is dreaming that, and he has so many efforts in India. And at one point, he has no money; he has no place to live. He's just going from home to home, from uh, some you know favorable person in Delhi, and trying to put out his back to Godhead. And always, he has that 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 mission somehow to spread Krishna consciousness. And then finally, as kind of a, what you know they, in the West, you know, the Hail Mary. Pass, you know, <laughs> it's like, all right, <laughs> hopefully someone will catch it, <laughs> you know, the football. So Prabhupada says, well, look, I tried everything in, to do it in India. And now, you know, this is what Chaitanya says, every town and village in the world, Prativiti means on the earth, Prativiti Achinati Nagarati. So I'm going, to, I'm going to New York. I'm going to New York. You know, he's 69. He's actually he was 68 when he got on that boat. There's a certain confusion of Prabhupada's age. And he had... He had those first, that first canto of the, of the Bhagavatam. He had gotten printed, three volumes, with great effort. Written it and edited it and checked the galleys, collected the money. Somehow he has these books. And he felt he had some ammunition, you know. So he had a sponsor. He got on the boat. It was a, a difficult passage. He had two heart attacks. You know, you can imagine how difficult. It was John Mashtami on the boat. He celebrated it with the, with the, uh, the, the uh, captain and his wife, you know, Vaishnavs also comes to America and lands in Boston. Look at this place. You know, you can imagine the bustle of the city. I used to live in New York. <laughs> this makes me, you know, just, to, just think of Prabhupada entering into New York and faced with it. <laughs> he eventually came down to New York, wrote a poem, praying to Krishna, make, make me dance, please make me dance, make me dance as you like. You brought me here somehow, then make my speaking somehow effective for them. He's wandering around in New York. He, first he goes to Butler, Pennsylvania, his only contact, and he's there a couple of weeks, you know, and a little, he didn't want to stay there, so he makes his way to New York, and he has a, a contact, Dr. Mishra, he's able to stay there, gets a little, con but he doesn't have his own place, he really can't preach openly, you know. Uh, he dictated the whole introduction, which is incredible, of this book, of, of the Bhagavad Gita. He, someone gave him a reel to reel, the old reel to reel recorders, even know what they are, you know, and he recorded that whole thing. The, the, the re tape recorder got stolen from his room, but they didn't, think, they didn't get the tapes. They didn't think of getting the tapes, thank God. Real treasure they left. <laughs> that's, that's it. Anyway, so, you know, he, he, he said, why should I live up here in this office? He didn't even have a, a proper uh, room. It was an office he's living in. So he had made some contacts. He was brought downtown down to the lower. I used to, I was living there practically a couple of years later. The Paradox Restaurant, there was a whole ferment of Eastern religions and, uh, you know, hippies and things going on. So Krishna just moved him around, moved him around, but great difficulty. He, I don't know if you know, he's living on the Bowery. Does the, the word Bowery mean anything? The New Yorkers know what the Bowery is, right, somebody? Nowadays we have the, 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 the homeless kind of everywhere. Every city has its homeless. In those days, in the 60s, 50s, if you were kind of, what do we, what do we call them? A, uh, not a transient, but a, a hobo or beggar or whatever. Uh, you'd go to New York, to the Bowery. So that would be your pilgrimage if you didn't have a home, you know. So you can imagine, you know, Prabhupada's living on the Bowery in a, in a loft with his fellow a young man who started taking LSD and went crazy, saw Prabhupada as a threat, started looking at him crazily. Prabhupada ran out the room. And down the stairs, he couldn't stay there anymore. He had nowhere to go. He's on the street. I mean, this is what he went through to give us Krishna consciousness. And eventually, of course, famously, he got 26 Second Avenue. Mukunda Maharaj, Michael Grant, who was one of his, you know, his wonderful contacts. He knew the ways. He got him that 26 Second Avenue. And the rest is history. So uh, why did Prabhupada do that? Obviously, he wasn't doing it to make money or get famous or anything like that usual. Emphasis. <laughs> He's doing it just out of his compassion, out of his firm uh, determination to follow the order of his spiritual master, come what may, even if he died trying. And then he had another heart, at heart attack or stroke in, in, uh, after about a year in, in, in May of 67. Just about at the end of this month would be, what, 52 years earlier. And uh, such a, so, that, so all of the, these purports 
uh, all the books that Srila Prabhupada has given us, he's just pouring out his, uh, his realization, his uh, knowledge that he's gleaned from his study and hearing his spiritual master and giving it to us as it is. You know, and here, here's the instruction, the simple instruction. Try to remember Krishna as much as possible so that at the time of death you can remember Krishna and successfully leave this body and not come back. It's a, it's a simple science. But because it's transcendental, beyond the range of, of our intelligence and mind, uh, you, it, it, it's, it's unknown, basically, in the Western in world. But Srila Prabhupada made it known. So the question is, uh, how, how can we follow this? Now, the last verse is very practical. Somehow or other, even in our daily lives, and most of us here, we have to work outside, we have to associate with non-devotees. But uh, somehow or other, to have a strong practice in your own life, to realize the importance of it, and following the principles Prabhupada gave, the four regular principles and so forth, and so that we can purify our existence and it becomes possible to think of Krishna and to apply this philosophy even in our lives and, 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 and that we're living outside. That's the whole meaning of Tasmatsa Vishukalishu. Therefore, at all times and all places, uh, remember me and fight. So Arjun's duty was to fight. You can, you can put in your own uh, uh, engagement there. We all have some engagement. Some of us are the fortunate few that our engagement is Krishna in consciousness. <laughs> but many, it's, it's not possible. But still, we have a, we have a freedom to, to read this or hear this, do this or hear this, or chant Hare Krishna or not. Uh, with your mind and intelligence fixed on me, you will certainly come to me. So I wanted to, I wanted to kind of uh, switch gears a little bit. I was first going to speak about something else, but this is basic Krishna consciousness, that uh, somehow or other we can organize our, our life that we're... Uh, we have time for serious sadhana, which means chanting, chanting on beads, chanting with others, studying the shastra, associating with devotees, visiting the temple, and basically choosing to, to be Krishna conscious as, as much as possible. So I wanted to, I wanted to uh, refer to something that you may not have thought of, and that is you know, this principle that's spoken of in the end of the third chapter, where material desire, lust, uh, covers our knowledge. Lust, is, is, of course, means sex desire, but it means any material desire. That this is the all-devouring sinful enemy of this world, Krishna says. So what is this kama? Kama and prema, there's a relationship. Kama is prema, which is pure love of God, that has been transformed by our contact with the material energy. This, this ardent desire that we have to enjoy our senses is originally our ardent desire, obsessive desire, to please Krishna's senses. That's the difference between prema and kama. This is a, a wonderful passage in the fourth chapter of Adi Lila of the Chaitanya Charitamrita, where Krishna's coverage is explaining who is Srimati Radharani, what are these gopis, what is prema, how does it work? And this, this verse, I'm, I'm not going to uh, impose my Bengali upon you, but uh, <laughs> basically he's saying the desire to satisfy one's own senses is kama. The desire to satisfy Krishna's senses is prema. And there's a very close relationship, as Prabhupada explains in one of the purports at the end of the third chapter here, that kama is nothing but prema that has been curdled, if you will, by association with the material energy. And birth after birth, we are suffering the results of our acting on the basis of our own material desire. And it's bringing us back again and again and again. And because this desire is almost always uh, uh, trying to be fulfilled without reference to the Vedas and, and, and restrictions and laws, uh, we become degraded and we lose the human form of life again and again. This is what's been going on. We don't know how many times we've been up and down these, this circuit. So now, let's not go down again. Let's stay as human, human beings, try to make progress in devotional service. And, of course, it's very encouraging that Krishna says in the second chapter, even a little progress will protect you from the greatest danger, losing the human form of life. So that's very encouraging. But there's also this, this very sober realization that we don't want to prolong our life here in this, in this Kali Yuga age, even uh, as human beings, even if we can't chant Hare Krishna. 
Prabhupada encourages, do your business and get out as far as possible. And that brings me to the other uh, idea that I wanted to cover. And that is that, this, just think of this principle that the more we're absorbed in material desires, the more our real knowledge will be covered. That's a, that's a principle. That's mentioned in the third chapter. Now, think a minute about what we call climate change or global warming. Um, this climate change is, uh, as we, most of, I hope most of you, the vast majority, believe in, in global warming, anthropocentric global warming. <laughs> We're doing it. Um, what is it a result of? It's this, the, the, this vast spread and the buildup of industry, all these, this burning of fossil fuels and everything else that's putting out the, the, these uh, uh, greenhouse gases, right? Mo a lot of it is cars and trucks and airplanes and everything, burning coal, all of this thing. So what, what is the, uh, the reason why that's going on? Because uh, the, the nature of, um, dare I say it, capitalism, of uh, the profit system, which is all, you know, everywhere, China, Russia, every place, they're all on this, uh, exploiting the earth, building up industry, making more money, and doing these things. The nature of it is, it's ever expanding, just like it says in the third chapter, never satisfied, it burns like fire. So this idea of, of exploiting more and more of the earth, the, the, the agribusiness, dare I mention, you know, slaughtering all these animals just for the tongue, completely unnecessary, all of that pours out these greenhouse gases and makes, it, makes the, the environment unlivable, ultimately. How many, uh, maybe some of you know this figure, there's hundreds of species that are being, going extinct every day. There's a, there's a huge crisis, and, you know, we don't really think about this, say, well, it's, it's nice, you know, but it's not nice that there's a huge insect apocalypse going on. Did you hear about that one? You know, we need these, there's, a, there's a, one a incredible balance, ecological balance that ultimately under the guidance of Krishna and his agents that makes it livable, this environment livable for human beings. And a large part of it is like the bees, first of all. You know, ever since many, many years, almonds have been a central part of my diet. You know, it's like a yogi food. Robert said you could eat eight a day or nine a day or something. So... You know, almonds require a tremendous amount of pollination from bees. California is the center of, of almond production in the world, I think, you know. They have to import all of these uh, bee uh, hives and everything from all over the country just to get the pollination done now. But they're dying off because of what, we, what they're doing, we're doing to the environment and many other bugs, and that's just a small part of it. So the idea is that, that this is not unknown. Back in the 80s, the Exxon guys, you know, the people who were, they have their own scientists, they knew about this. And what was their response? How can we convince people that it's not an emergency? And maybe many of you don't remember, you remember the, what happened with the cigarettes? You know, for years, there would be advertisements, and I remember in Life magazine, when I was a kid in Look, Look magazine, there'd be a doctor, or at least someone who looked like a doctor, you know, in the ad, he said, yes, there's no indication that, uh, you know, or, or rather, these cigarettes are good for you. Don't worry about it, you know what I mean? Until finally, they caught him, you know, in billions of dollars of suits and everything. Yeah, anyone could tell that it's not good for you. It's, so it's not good for us to overexploit the material energy, to build up all this technology, and to create this. But, but even though it's known, the sciences, and we, I mean, there's, there's right in Puri, they have the emergency, you know, the huge cyclone, and it happened to be 425 miles an hour, you know. I don't even remember the names of the, the, the uh, hurricanes that hit last season, Florida and North Carolina and Houston the year before, disastrous, you know. So that's, and what's happening in the Arctic, you know, you read about it, it's like, hello, and Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. That's, that's, that should be a, a major response. We don't want to come back to this, to this <laughs> world that's... Uh, uh, getting warmer and warmer and more and more unlivable. But at the same time, Krishna consciousness has the answer, and that is simple living and high thinking. The ideal is not all of this consumerism, overconsumption, extravagance. To really live simply as possible, you know, with a, a smaller carbon footprint, if you want to call it like that. And, say, and you don't need so many things. 
The, 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 whole, the whole economy is built on impl implanting unnecessary desires in your heart. So that you buy things that you don't need with money you don't have. So you go into debt, right? And they, they got you. So many thousands of dollars of you know, debt. So, so uh, this, this is a, a metaphor, and it's, it's amazing because those who are, who are in control, the big money people and all the politicians and everything, there's a tremendous resistance. You know, they come to these agreements, the Paris Agreement, this and that, but they never do anything. The engine of consumption and, and more and more oil is, is so powerful. We're seeing it enacted on a, on a worldwide scale. You know, Russia's not going to stop pumping oil. That's all they got. Uh, isn't it? That's basically what they got. <laughs> coal? Oh, we got in India. We got so many coal plants. It's insane. But it's exactly enacting what we see uh, mentioned in the third chapter. And the 16th chapter, too. I was going to read some of that, the, the demons. All I know is, what do I have today? How can I get more tomorrow? How can I make this war? And so forth. We're living in that uh, society now. So personally, our response should be be as Krishna conscious as possible. Understand the emergency s uh, situation, the urgency. So throughout the Bhagavatam, it's told. E each one of us, of course, is going to face our own little apocalypse. apocalypse. That's not a mystery. But, uh, but on, a, on a wider scale, we should see that we don't want to come back. You know, sometimes you get this illusion, well, uh, all right, I did so much Krishna kind. I mean, it says, Neha become an You know, I'm not going to lose any of it, so I'll come back, I'll, be, I'll join the ashram in the next life. Don't do it. Let's, let's not do that. <laughs> even, even, even just 20, 30 years from now, you don't know what's going to happen. It's moving so fast, you know. So the, the, the idea of, of uh, remembering Krishna as far as possible, becoming truly Krishna conscious, means that you're, you can be more tolerant. You can understand things in perspective. Even your own you know, demise, which is always a crisis in everyone's life, you can, you can see that in Krishna conscious perspective rather than this all-encompassing disaster you know, that's com completely uh, overwhelming your mind with anxiety. You know, to be able to face uh, extreme trouble with uh, equanimity is one of the one, you know, uh, wonderful uh, uh, side benefits, if you will, of Krishna consciousness. And we saw it amongst great devotees. Of course, Srila Prabhupada was amazing. You know, and, and the last year, you know, he was getting someone and he, was, he, would, he would be lying there, you know, and, and health was getting weaker and weaker. Someone would come, and he would be concerned. Did you get enough prasadam? How's your, you know, you know, people would cry to see that. You were there at the time. So that's, uh, you know, the ideal uh, life of Srila Prabhupada. We can take inspiration from that and try to follow this as much as possible. Integrate uh, japa into your day uh, more and more and become Krishna conscious and come to the point of my uh, arpatamano buddhir, dedicating our mind and our senses and our intelligence to Krishna and uh, we'll be on the safe side. So that's all I have to say this evening. If there's any comments or questions... Okay, we have one comment, a question. Hold on a minute, we have a mic here. So. Uh, can you be the mic runner? Okay. <laughs> Bull, that was wonderful. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. I just wanted to mention, um, it was a few years ago. Hold it up. It was a few years ago at the Rathiyatra Festival. And um, I remember seeing one of the kids' plays, and maybe it was an adult's play, and... Um, um, one Prabhu. Um, anyway, the moral of the story is um, he was he was passing away, and he remembered Ram, 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 and then Ram came up and said, "Oh, you're going, you know, you're going up, you're going to." Virginia. Anyway, when I when I think about my last moment, I I only think of Ram, Ram, Ram. I, I it's really weird because all day long, Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. You know, but um, when I pass, I'm I'm gonna just chant Ram because I saw that play and it got embedded in my head. <laughs> you know, but Ram Krishna, it's all good. Good, Hare good. Hare Krishna, Hare Rama. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, one of our seniors over here. Kindly accept my humble obeisances. I, guess got mine. I have been listening to these lectures for the last 30 years.
Mm. And I'm a life member of uh, International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Every time I listen to this uh, Krishna Loka, it's ideal. I want to be there. But where is this Krishna Loka located? I cannot understand. Krishna Loka is, is far, far away and also very, very close, just like Krishna. Prabhupada, I remember saying that this is uh, on a lecture, um, that wherever, wherever Krishna is, there too is Srimati Radharani and all the gopis and Mother Yashoda and the whole Vrindavan. So what does it say in a Brahma Samhita? Preman janat churita bhakti velochane na santak sadeva didihesha veloke yanti yang shyama sunda dama chindu gana sorupam govinda mari purusham tamaham bajamin. I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord. Those whose eyes are anointed, smeared with the pulp of prema or love, they can always see that shyama sundar within their hearts. Not just the super soul, but they're actually shyama sundar. So the idea is that, that the great devotees, they live on two planes. You know, Prabhupada said, go back home, back to Godhead. But we saw that he himself was always back to Godhead. He, was, he brought the Godhead with him. Wherever you are, there is Vrindavan. You know, the writer said famously, Lord Chaitanya. So the idea is that Krishna can be as close as we want him to be. We can, we can think of Krishna, we can hear about the, the, the spiritual world, Vrindavan, the, 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 the uh, Bhagavad Purana, the Krishna book. And uh, if we are absorbed in Krishna consciousness and we are realized, fully mature, when we leave our body, we'll instantly be there in, in Goloka Vrindavan. So where, is, where is that Golok? <laughs> It's, be, it's beyond the realm of this material world. You know, you read the Srimad Bhagavatam. We live in, you know, the, you hear the phrase Brahmanda? Brahmanda means egg. Brahma, Brahma means Lord Brahma. So each universe has its own Brahma. And it's like an egg in the sense that it, there's a little space in the middle where we're living, but then there's a big shell. There's a earth, water, fire, air, ether. You know, it's, it's, there's this barrier of all the material elements separating us from the causal ocean and then the, you know, the, the, the Vekunta planets and the highest Vekunta planet is, is Krishna Loka. So it's very, very far away. You can't reach by any kind of spaceship. You know. No, where is it located? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll consult my GPS cell you know. <laughs> It's located where Krishna is enjoying his eternal pastimes. <laughs> Can someone take the mic from him, please? <laughs> oh, we have another question up here. Okay, we have a few minutes. Oh. Hare Krishna, yes, Hare Babaji. Babaji. You mentioned that after leaving the body, soul takes an, another birth. Then why the shrad is recommended in the shastras like every month? Like why is what make him recommend? Sh shrad, shradha. Oh, shrad, shrad. Yeah, like every month on Amavas, yeah, we have to give the water, or the food, or and the f like once a year maha mahale Amavas, yeah. Then like do the people do the shrad for once a year? So why those things are mentioned? Because that soul has taken the birth and is like enjoying the next body, and whom we are giving the water and the food, you know. That's my question. Yes. Well, the, the Shraddha ceremony is an offering of a prasadam, isn't it, to the <coughs> departed? Pitras, yeah, the, the people the who left the party, you know, for yeah, them. The yes. yeah. Well, the thing is that one's uh, destiny, there's still, a, there's still a connection with the, the people you had a connection to. And you can, you can help their passage, you know, uh, in, in the future. Even though they may have uh, entered another body or another relationship, still there's a connection that you can have that soul. So that shraddha is a, is a way of uh, help, helping the soul, you know, to to pass on to a more auspicious birth. And it's it's something that uh, descendants do, you know, and relatives do in order to help those who are related to. But really, the the shraddha ceremony, uh, if you are practicing Krishna consciousness, just like uh, of course, famous, most famously, Prahlad Maharaj. He was wondering, forgive me, my, my, you know, I'm old now, and it's hard for me to sit for so long. 
I'm getting a little cramped. So the, um, uh, he was worried, you know, about his uh, father, right? And uh, he had, uh, the, his, uh, Lord Nishingadev offered him some boons. He said, take whatever you want. You can have a planet, whatever. So Pallad complained. So why are you tempting me? I'm not doing business with you. I'm not some vanik, you know? I'm simply serving, serving you out of love. But then he saw that there was, uh, that, uh, he, he, that Nishingadev really wanted to give him uh, a boon, you know? So he asked boon that his father would be delivered. His father was like, uh, you know, the demon, the, the, the ideal demon, you know, the, the model of which all the demons are made. And he uh, says, oh, don't worry. So many of your relatives uh, back uh, so many generations and further generations. And we saw that with, Bana, you know, Bana and, of course, Bali, you know, they were, they were all uh, favored by the Lord. They are all already been delivered. So the best thing we can do for our relatives even the ones who are living now, or fathers, fathers, or or descendants, is to become Krishna conscious. That's more powerful than any shrad ceremony, because uh, there's a there's a relationship. You know, you're thinking of them, and they're and you're thinking of them. Uh, you know, the, the, and, and when they when you have descendants, even if you're gone, they'll be thinking of you. And when they think of you, oh yes, I remember my great grandmother. She was a devotee of Krishna, and immediately the name Krishna is there. Is it? <laughs> So, that, so that's the more important for helping uh, those who are close to us, whether friends, relatives, or ancestors, or whatever, descendants, is to be uh, as, be as good a devotee as possible. Ms. Krishna. Okay, we have a couple more minutes. You better keep asking questions, otherwise I'm going to inflict a couple of poems on you. <laughs> oh, we have over here. Oh, okay, I'm relieved. Let me answer the lady's question. Go ahead. When we do Shraddha. Shraddha, Shraddha is Atmic connection, Atma connection. What you do is you are talking to your ex-parents or relatives through the connection. It's a spiritual connection that you have. If you want to really see it, I have been to Bali three times. Go and see there how they do it in Bali. Mm. You will know. It's an atomic connection. It is not some fanfare or just a procession or relationship. It's a very big thing if you understand it. If you don't believe it, you don't believe in anything. Okay. And when you have that connection, you chant Hare Krishna for them. <laughs> All right, one more. Okay. Oh, here. Rajendranana Prabhu. It's a, is it on? Hare Krishna. it's a perfect example of a cultured gentleman. Mm -hmm. In India, in the Vedic culture, they understand these things. How when you are born, you have responsibilities in so many ways. You're indebted to your forefathers. You're indebted to the sages. You're indebted even to the, the cow or the king who's protecting the country, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so the scriptures recommend that you pay your debts, that you show your respect, and specifically the way we've been taught by Srila Prabhupada that the Shraddha is dealing mainly with karma kanda. It's not specifically on the spiritual platform, it's, it's pertaining to the material debts that we have on the bodily platform. Of course we're all souls, but the thought that Dravida raised that Krishna smashed Arjuna's illusion that that's your parent, that's your brother, that how many brothers and parents have you had over the course of time immemorial changing bodies? It's unlimited. So the, the Shraddha helps the forefathers stay happy and together in Prithi Loka. That's what we've been taught. Yeah. And if you don't offer the respects and do the pujas, then their uh, meter runs out and they have to take birth back in the earth and who knows where they go after that. Mm. Uh, Dravida Prabhu is making mention that on the spiritual platform, when you please Krishna, who's in charge of everything, in control of everyone and everything, he's the master of all the demigods who facilitate the forefathers being taken care of, etc. When you worship him, 
And if you surrender your life to him, the exact number of generations that are uh, liberated according to the Lord speaking to Plot is 21 generations. Ten back, ten forward, and your own family. 21 generations. See how much gratitude Krishna has for one person rendering loving service to him. It's the best way to take care of all your debts. If you go to the top, you know, cut out all the middlemen and go to the top, which is Krishna. Please him, surrender to him, chant his names, which is the essential point of Dravida's class. If we just add that chanting of Hare Krishna, then that is the easiest way to uh, take care of any and all of those that you love and have some uh, responsibility to. Right. Thank you for that. Thank you, Raj. All right, three minutes for a couple of poems. It said you're supposed to end on something sweet, really sweet. Madodam, madodam, babodasse, vebo, madodam, madodam, badanam, madodam. Madogan, dimadu, smita, meta, raho, madodam, 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 madodam. Sweet, sweet is my dear Lord's form. Sweet is still his face, so fair. But his honey scented, gentle smile is sweet beyond compare. And then we'll end with some nice sweet verse about the holy name. Marudu marudu meta mangalam mangalana Sakala nagama valli satpalam chitswarupam Sakura rapi padigitam shadhaya heleya bha Bhagavadana matram tari eight krishna nama Of sweet things, it's the sweetest you will taste at any time. Of things that bring good fortune, it's the perfect paradigm. Of all the Vedic writings, it's the transcendental fruit, the very form of spirit, unalloyed and absolute. When uttered even once with faith, or uttered once with none, from birth and death, it surely will deliver anyone. And in the end, it brings pure love for Krishna, life's true aim. So cast away all doubt and chant Sri Krishna's holy name. All glories to Srila Prabhupada.